Um, I would like to welcome you to the great debate, which will cover an interesting topic today. So we'll speak about the role of scientific information in emerging environmental crises. The reason we want to look at this topic is that we notice that every day we have to take quite a lot of decisions uh, which are related to our well-being, which are related to our life, which are related to our property. And oftentimes we see that we as a scientific community are under severe stress when we have to provide a scientific information, robust scientific information in the cases where those decisions related to our lives and property have to be taken by the authorities. And this is the most often question which we as a scientific, uh, scientific community are asked when it comes to disaster management. And there are multiple tools and there are observational data and forecasting in the warning system which exist in this area. And some of the warning system have quite a long history, but there are some events which you can forecast to a certain extent, uh, which you can't forecast. And the situation becomes even more complicated when the forecasting and when the data to take decisions are not there. And uh, we've been in this situation in the case of our COVID pandemic, when the thing was new and we don't know how it works, but it doesn't apply only to pandemic. There are multiple areas of our life where we have to take decisions based on the uncertain or limited scientific information. There is some known knowns, there are some unknown, and there are some unknown unknowns, which we even don't, which we can't even estimate what it is, but we as a scientific community are asked to provide decision under very, very hard time constraints and under very difficult circumstances. So the point of this debate is actually to try and understand what is the role of scientific community when we have to provide information and then such information is limited or when we have the uncertainty or when there is a public crisis. What, what can we do? How do we manage this uncertainty? How do we manage the expectations of the policymakers? And um, I would like to introduce our outstanding panel which is with us today. Uh, we, still, we are still missing our first panelist, uh, Ms. Uh, Vasiti Soko. We hope that she will connect to us as soon as possible. And uh, I just wanted to uh, tell that uh, Vasiti is a director of Natural Disaster Management Office in Fiji. She has uh, an industry experience which spans 15 years on the high technical field of geospatial science and surveying. She has assisted a number of significant projects uh, while working for Fijian government, including development of disaster integrated system prior to taking her current role. She has also worked as a, uh, across a regional projects in Nauru, Federation of Mini, uh, Micronesia, Palau, uh, Tuvalu, Marshall Island, Kiribati in Australia. Um, Vasati did her master in uh, RMIT in Melbourne in Australia, and her research focuses on the impact of the Fiji new datum on which she updated and transformed the parameter for Fiji maritime boundaries. Uh, she is the first female director of uh, Fiji's um, National uh, Office for uh, Disaster Management, and she's very familiar with the challenges of the work in the male dominated profession like hers. And as a result, she has developed and a keen interest to put those norms where the gender equality comes first are into the norm in the office. She's passionate to change the stereotype centered, particularly around gender roles in the wider Pacific community. And since taking her role as a director, she made some significant achievements uh, with a partial relocation of some communities due to sea level rise and uh, establishment of Fiji Community Disaster Management Training uh, Manual. And Fiji become first country in the world to validate tar target E of the CINDAP framework. Uh, she reviewed the National Disaster Management Act and impacted the renovation 
of the Disaster Management Office. Uh, she is a chair or co-chair of the Pacific uh, Technical Working Group on Human Mobility. She's a deputy chair, uh, chair of Asia Pacific Technical Working Group on disaster related statistics. And she is a co-chair of the Pacific Response to Disaster Displacement Advisory Board. And she champions uh, the causes of inclusivity and a first female director of this office. Um, I hope that she manages to connect to us. Uh, I, oh, she is here. Hello, Vasid. <laughs> I just introduced you. It's very nice to see you with us. Thank you, uh, thank, thank, you. thank you very much for joining. So then I would introduce our, our uh, next panelist. So our next panelist is Dr. Matthew Hort from Med Office UK. Uh, Dr. Hort is the head of Atmospheric Dispersion and Air Quality Research Group at Med Office UK. And in his role, he led and um, coordinated Met Office research into the emissions, transport, and fate of hazardous gas and aerosol contaminants with a focus on linking atmospheric science to emergency responses, societal, industrial, and environmental impacts. Uh, Dr. Hoth uh, has worked at the Met Office for 22 years, during which time he has conducted and led the team in research on atmospheric dispersion and composition modeling, ranging from animal disease, fires, uh, and vector-based spread, such as food and moth and blue tongue, to air quality and volcanic eruptions. Uh, Dr. Hot has provided input to the UK gov governmental advice, scientific advisory group on emergencies, UK preparedness and planning activities, including national exercises and the UK national risk assessment uh, process for a range of natural and anthropogenic disasters. And he has and continues to serve on a number of national and international bodies, such as for World Meteorological Organization, International Civil Aviation Organization, United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic uh, Radiation and UK Government Review Bodies. Um, he has an extensive experience in bringing cross-disciplinary side and as part of the both uh, the Met Office team and his team, he led the input into the responses to several national and international emergencies, um, including the food and moth outbreak in 2001 and 2007, Pluton outbreak in North Europe 2006 and 2008 and 2016, and Icelandic volcanic eruptions 2010, 11, and 14, as well as Fukushima nuclear accident. So he is very well familiar with the area we are going to discuss today. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Nadezhda. I don't know, is it better to say Nadezhda or Nadia <laughs> Komendantova, who works in the Advanced System Analysis Program of International Institute for Applied S System Analysis. Uh, Dr. Komendantova is a group leader in the International Institute for um, YASA, and she leads the Cooperation and Transformative Governance Group. This group is dealing with system level transformation and key transition for societal resilience and sustainable system through an enhanced understanding of and ability to manage existing challenges, including societal dilemma and wicked problems of public policy planning. She coordinates and contributes to a number of international projects with the other international organizations, such as Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, United Nations Industrial Development Organization, Organization for Cooperation and Development in Europe, and International Anti-Corruption Academy, and many others. She is a lead author of the draft of strategy of industrial development of Kyrgyzstan, of the Handbook on Protection of Electricity Network from Natural Hazard for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, which was translated also into Russian and Arabic languages and contributed to a number of international reports on water energy nexus, energy security, and participatory governance. The work of Dr. Kamandantova includes more than 140 publications, among them the Global Corruption Report, the Global Assessment 
uh, the Global Assessment Report, input papers for the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, the chapter on risk governance for global report, uh, issues by the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery of the World Bank, and contribution to the Global Renewable Energy Report, as well as a number of the other peer-reviewed publications in the journals such as energy policy, natural hazards, renewable and sustainable energy reviews, and so on. She works also, her, her, her work also has been granted awards from Academic Council of United Nations, as well as Julius Schrupp Foundation. She received a number of invitations to speak at high level forums, such as Directorate General for Research and Innovation of the European Commission, NATO, Energy Community Secretariat, Energy Charter Forum and Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, welcome, Nadezhda, and thank you for joining us. And the last but not the least speaker, also very important and very famous and very well-known person, Dr. William Pan from Duke University uh, from the United States. Uh, Dr. Pan is Elizabeth Brooke Wright and White Law, right, uh, Associate Professor of Population Studies and Global Environmental Health at Duke University, with primary appointment in the Duke Global Health Institute in Nicolau School of Environment. He received his doctorate training from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in biostatistics and dem demography, with focused training in infectious disease, environmental epidemiology, remote sensing, and biosense special statistics. He has over 20 years of experience studying the relationship between human environment dynamics and health. He leads an interdisciplinary research team that has published over 100 peer-reviewed papers and manuscripts on topics such as metabolic biomarkers in child growth, mercury toxicity, infectious disease, vaccine responses, and reproductive health. He currently leads research in three areas, the development of malaria early warning system for Amazon, uh, measurement of long-term health impacts of in utero and chronic mercury exposure in artisanal and small-scale gold mining region and evaluation of mercury-free and mercury capture technologies in artisanal and small-scale gold mining. His research has been supported by NASA, the U.S. National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation, and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Dr. Pan has worked diligently with local stakeholders and partners to maximize a research impact. This includes appointment as director of Duke Peru Priority Partnership Location, executive steering member of North Carolina One Health Collaborative, scientific advisory committee for the Population Environment Research Network, and technical science advisory panel for effectiveness evaluation of Minamata Convention, which is a global mercury treaty. He has participated in expert advisory panels, including Lancet Countdown for Climate and Health in Peru, Peru Congressional Commission on, I'm sorry, now it goes in Spanish, Pueblo Adinos, <laughs> uh, which worked on the, on the heavy metals as well, and our uh, UNEP population and climate change. He has been recognized for his contribution to global health with James E. Prizel, distinguished alumni and National Institute of Health uh, for the International Center Directors Awards. Um, thank you, Dr. Pan, for joining us. And with this outstanding panel, I would like to jump in right into our discussion. And um, I would address the, the first question to Ms. Soko. And this question is, uh, it looks quite simple. Are you work in the areas of natural disaster and you work basically with hydrometeorological disaster. And for this area, it seems that we have the warning and forecasts for many years. And for the person who is not engaged in metrology, that may look quite simple. You know, people just go on the internet and look at the weather forecast and it looks very simple. So my question is that, there is a large degree of confidence that we know what happens in metrology. And you as a person working for the disaster management, you as probably better than anybody else knows what is the uncertainty which comes with those forecasts. Is it always easy 
to take a decision based on the forecast. And when you have the issues and you have a stress on taking the decisions, how do you overcome that? Thank you, Ms. Soko, the floor is yours. So please uh, tell us, share your experience. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. And Bulevnak everybody um, from Fiji. Um, with regards to uh, impact-based forecasting, um, the Fiji NDMO works very closely with the Fiji Met Office with regards to areas that have been affected. Um, we have a standard operating procedure in place uh, with, uh, with the Fiji Met Office in regards to cyclone when it's about to approach. So we have a 72 hours of impact, 48 hours to impact, 24 hours to impact and 12 hours to impact. Um, the processes to follow and the actions to do are documented. Um, however, given, uh, given, given the situation, if I must say, uh, it changes. Uh, and when we are issued warnings uh, and when we, the NDMO usually waits for the track map to be released by the net office. Uh, I understand that there are few other you know, international organizations that also release track map, but due to the responsible agency and the accountability, uh, we have to use the Fiji Met Office track map. Uh, so as of when the track map is released, uh, the NDMO adopts the track map um, and use the track map to assist decision makers with regards to one, populations that are highly, uh, highly likely to be affected, um, government assets that are within the path of the, the incoming storm, uh, in addition to, um, you know, uh, transportations that are highly likely going to be affected. Uh, we also advise government as to when to shut down, uh, you know, flights or if there's um, out, uh, you know, maritime travelers, when to stop boats from traveling. Um, so all these critical decisions from government are done using the track map that is released by the Fiji Met Office. Um, the uncertainty lies when um, the exact area of uh, or, or the landfall continues to change. Uh, a classic example was the uh, TCSA, a Cat 5 storm cyclone that we experienced this year. Um, as of when the cycle was making its way to Fiji from Vanuatu, um, I think we had about three areas of landfall. Uh, and then the last one being uh, at least within, within the boundary of eight hours uh, to impact. And so it changed, it continues to change the planning behind the track map. So the uncertainty lies within that area. Now, one of the ways that we've tried to improve this uncertainty in working with Fiji Met Office is to have what we call a buffer. Um, again, uh, trying to minimize uncertainty. Uh, we don't, uh, we're still trying to analyze whether wind speed is something that we need to factor in. However, because of the land mass that we have here in Fiji, uh, we've opted to use a buffer. So within the buffer from the eye of the cyclone, we have a 50 kilometer buffer uh, from the eye of the cyclone, which we classify them as red zone. Uh, and then the 100 kilometer be uh, becoming our amber and then the uh, anything above that becoming, uh, you know, green or likely to be affected. Um, so using that buffer allows us to consider the uncertainty behind uh, the cyclone track map once it's been issued. And given the time to prepare um, is also limited to that, it allows us uh, enough time to reach out to the community and also activate our evacuation centers uh, by having that boundary of uh, 50 kilometer from the eye of the cyclone, just to uh, allow some uncertainty with regards to the cyclone track map. Um, so becoming very critical, having SOPs in place, uh, you know, having uh, um, well, uh, you know, advanced technology. We're fortunate here in Fiji. Some of the, or if not most of the data that we have are in spatial uh, format, which allows us at the NDMO um, to analyze data as of when we receive the track map, uh, to which we are able to advise our government uh, or the leaders uh, about the. Uh, likely populations that are going to be affected uh, and those that will be affected. So the likely versus the actuals. 
Um, so this is the you know the role of the NDMO uh, when it comes to impact-based forecasting. Uh, we're exploring options where we want to use wind speed. Uh, we, we, we're looking at other options, but otherwise, uh, as practice for disaster management in Fiji, this is currently what we are using. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it's it's quite interesting that you speak about the buffer and that you try to minimize the uncertainty by, by introducing something which which would minimize the damage. And if we look uh, at my next question, which I wanted to ask to Dr. Hort, that in the case of fire metrology, we've seen that you can use the buffers and you can have at least some uncertainty around the forecasting. I know that you've been working with the areas of volcanic eruptions. And our, when you have a volcanic eruptions, it's extremely critical if you need to land the aircraft so they can still fly. And uh, the volcanic eruptions are probably slightly more uncertain than the meteorological, meteorological phenomena. Um, so uh, could you please share your experience on how the uncertainty is treated in the cases of volcanic ash spread? And are, how do you make decisions or how do you advise on the decisions? if it is safe to fly it or not. We've seen the episodes of AU Fiat Loyoki, where the whole Europe was standing still, nothing was flying, and then we heard that probably it was not so bad. Matt, please. Certainly, thank you, Alexander. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about um, volcanic ash and specifically about aviation hazards. Um, obviously there are lots of um, other hazards associated with volcanic eruptions, um, but I will focus on that. And to pick up on what Oksana has just said, um, the reason in a way that these are more uncertain than say just meteorology is because the, these types of problems inherit the uncertainty from the meteorology. We, you know, that is a factor and then any other process or any other part of it adds to that. Um, so that's why we get this sort of compounding effect of uncertainties and complexity. But next slide, please. So, um, for those that don't know, in the, in the middle there, there's a map um, that shows a uh, representation of the volcanoes around the world, but also sketched onto it are areas for the volcanic ash advisory centers. Um, these are nine centers around the world that have responsibility for providing operational um, uh, advice to aviation on uh, the hazard from volcanic eruptions. Um, now this is 24-7, 365 days a year and in fact the volcanic ash advisory centres are tasked with issuing an alert within 20 minutes of them being notified of an eruption or them detecting an eruption um, and then producing an entire model prediction within an hour. Um, so this is very fast um, and the chain of and flow of information, it, it needs to be quick as well. So this is a very simplified representation of that. We have state volcano observatories um, responsible for monitoring volcanoes in their countries um, and they have a, 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 a duty to inform the VACs and cascade the information about the occurrence of the eruption. Um, this may seem uh, relatively straightforward, you know, volcanic eruption is, can be a fairly big event, but volcanoes can be in very remote locations, um, hard to monitor, um, and more importantly, hard to monitor quantitatively, which we'll come to in a bit. Um, you know, it's one thing to say, yes, an eruption is occurring, um, but if we want to provide a sensible warning, we also need to know the scale of that, the, the characteristics of that. Um, so that information flows to the Volcanic Ash Advisory Centres, which are based in national meteorological organisations around the world. Um, and there that information is combined with other information and, you, and models um, to provide guidance products on the presence of ash, um, which I'll also talk about more in a minute. Now that information further then flows on to national meteorological offices in each country for onward dissemination to aviation operators, regulators, air traffic controls, and government bodies. What is different here to the talk we just heard is that this service is really focused on providing information to, if you like, professional bodies and organizations. This isn't about providing information to the public. Having said that, the information is available to the public and, and is published openly. Um, but 
the fact that it is aimed at, if you like, these other organizations does mean that the information is constructed in very specific ways. Um, that's not that's file format to get technical, but also the language used, the way things are represented um, is all tailored to the requirements of the industry. And so for others looking at it, it can potentially be confusing, um, seem to be missing information, seem to contain um, information that doesn't seem so relevant um, and use language that isn't perhaps immediately transparent to everyone, which is, I think, an important aspect of some of these communications around hazards is you need to be aware of who it's aimed at and whether or not that can cause challenges in the wider area. Um, so, you know, and that can even extend to other government bodies. In, in the UK, we have um, uh, an in emergencies, a scientific advisor group for emergencies that is, it stands up, SAGE, um, and, and volcanic hazards present other hazards um, to countries and they may be interested in the information um, and they'll look to this information from the VAX um, to assist them but that can require translation because they may be looking at it for other concerns such as wider transport disruption the need to repatriate citizens etc uh, and require further um, interpretation of the information that is being used by the the, the VAX so next slide please if we just dig down, this, these events share lots of commonalities, I believe, with a range of things. So we think of nuclear accidents as well as volcanic eruptions, large industrial accidents, or even biological hazards to animals and plants. Um, we have a series of components that, that represent, and as I mentioned, weather is one component of this, which is where we get some of our uncertainty. We also have what we call emissions, so that's what's being um, emitted into the atmosphere, uh, um, be that volcanic ash, volcanic gases or other materials from other events. We then have processes, dispersion in this diagram, in the atmosphere. So how does that material interact with meteorology? You know, it's not just uh, um, being blown around, it will interact with precipitation, humidity in the air, it might undergo transformations through chemical reaction or, or, or other processes that means that they're the, the new compounds are formed and new hazards emerge um, at different distances from the event. Um, we then have to consider the impact. Are we worried about health or are we worried about machinery? You know, volcanic ash is primarily a concern for the aviation industry due to the effect it has on engines and airframes, not for the effect it directly has on human health. Um, uh, and so we need to be aware of that, think about that. Um, if we're to understand whether what sort of hazard this presents um, to, to our society. And then actions, what actions might we take? Um, or what actions might others be taking? At the end of the day, this is about supporting action um, and mitigating. It's not actually about scientific endeavor of investigating the problem. So we need to make sure our science is fit for those actions to be taken and listen to what the decision makers need rather than perhaps what we as scientists think is the most interesting or important aspect. And all of that is, is underlined by considerable uncertainty at every stage. Um, you know, even actions have uncertainty, they have consequences, how people will in, respond to instruction. Um, and so there's, there's uncertainty at every point in this. Next slide, please. Focusing a bit more on the, on the science, just, just to draw out a couple of examples. We obviously, observations are very important. We have considerable observation uh, requirements and needs, both local to the volcano in this instance, but also remotely from the volcano. And we have an example there of a satellite image. Um, but there are uncertainties in those. Many of these are remote sensing um, activities. They're not directly measuring the quantities we're interested in. Um, and they're having to be converted um, into those quantities um, that actually matter. We then have modeling um, and we have lots of processes there. We, and there are lots of stages to modeling, be, be that numerical weather prediction or the atmospheric transport models um, that can introduce uncertainty. We, we then have uncertainty, as I said, in the impact in this example, jet engines, how exactly does it affect, ash affect engines? What is that? Uh, and work here has contributed to an evolution in the, the presentation and communication traditionally and, and still widespread use is just a simple hazard area. An example there is just some polygons drawn on the top plot. Um, but increasingly aviation is moving to wanting to work with things like concentrations explicitly and therefore understand how much a plane is exposed to on a flight path. 
due to the realization that it's not a case of encounter, you know, ash or no ash. It's actually the amount of ash you encounter gradually degrades engines, and therefore you can be exposed to limited quantities perfectly safely. Um, but you need to obviously understand those quantities. And that's before we get into probabilities and doing things like ensemble modeling. Considerable scientific opportunity in across this spectrum. Next slide, please. Okay, so I won't go through all these points on this, but just to conclude, events are rare. Um, and they, um, that can present us problems in terms of uh, practicing and evaluating our approaches and, and our observation and modeling techniques. The next event will always be different. And I think the final, and so we need to not get fixated on previous events um, and plan for the last event. We need to um, prevent ourselves from doing that if we can. We also need to um, think about what our science is going to be used for and really think about the fact that the science isn't the end point. It's an important component and that requires us to do an extra translational step or communication step over and above, um, if you like, the math, the physics, the chemistry, the geophysics, that is our core discipline potentially. Um, and that's where we can really have ensure impact and value from our science. Thank you. Over to you, Oksana. Thank you, Matt. That was really great. And uh, you highlighted several areas of uncertainty and our uh... You see, we heard from Vasati that you can do 50 kilometers buffer. In your case, it's probably difficult to do 50 kilometers buffer because there are many more uh, impacts. We will come to the discussion. I wanted to move our forward to our next panelist, uh, uh, Dr. Pian. And I will ask him the following question. So our, as, as you noticed, we organized a debate in the level of the increasing uncertainty. So we start from something where we can take the buffer 50 kilometers. Then we go to something where actually it, it comes to can we fly or can't we fly. And I will ask you a very interesting question. You've been at the front as a front runner in the our analysis of the connection between the COVID and meteorology and climate and our, in the beginning of the pandemic our people were discussing that probably if it gets warmer the virus will not spread and then there was some our let's say non-peer-reviewed publications but like the first calculations and simple correlations which demonstrated that probably it could but just it was because spring it was getting warmer and then it actually gets completely opposite route and this is the case uh, where information is much more uncertain. I mean, we know about metrology, probably we know something about volcanoes. And the beginning of pandemic, we knew, some, we knew nothing about COVID. And you and many other scientists were requested to give advice to the uh, countries and to the authorities. Do we do lockdown or we don't do lockdown? or how do we manage now? So can you share your experience on this area of providing scientific robust decisions where we don't have enough information and then you are super under super stress by the policymakers. They just come to you and say, Is, does it work or it doesn't? And you actually don't know. Thanks for the question. Um, I think what Dr. Hort just said at the very end is probably the heart of what I will probably respond to about and, and stress, which is how we communicate uh, science to, to decision makers. Um, first, let me just say thank you for, for inviting me on this panel. It's, it's a pleasure to be here among so many great panelists. Um, I'm coming from North Carolina in the US where it's 3.30 in the morning now, so um, I don't have any slides, so you can all look at me as I, as my, my brain is sort of working and my mouth is working, um, but half of me is still sleeping. But for this question on how do we communicate, uh, I guess, recommendations to policymakers, I, I had a lot of different thoughts on this, but I, I think I can uh, summarize them in three different points. The first one is that 
we are always making decisions with imperfect data. Policymakers always do this. They're, they're wonderful, as you had said, Oksana, they're wonderful at using, not using, ignoring, and also misinterpreting science sometimes. And, and their job is actually to make policy with imperfect data. I don't think that we, we, we should not forget that as scientists. I also think that for policymakers and as scientists, we are actually quick to blame them for a lot of the problems that we are, we are having for not listening to data. And I can't tell you how many times that I've heard from colleagues, as well as very senior emeritus professors, how their research and recommendations are not being used and they're being ignored by current policy being made. I often hear situations where you have one side of an argument with a preponderance of data available and the trend supporting a particular point of view and the other side is showing study outliers, anecdotal stories that raise questions about the broad applicability of the perceived preponderance of data trends. And as a scientist, we can sit back and criticize policymaking, the policymaking process, but we have to remind ourselves that policymaking is not a binary exercise. The final decisions might be, and they might be even you know, more than binary, but just like every science represented here at EJU, policymaking is political science. Uh, there's uncertainty in the decisions, there's measurements, there's ideal times at which they wanna conduct surveys, gather data, measure and analyze. Uh, but policymaking is a science uh, and it's subject to the same constraints that we have. And I don't think that's something that's always recognized um, from a non-political science point of view. But this goes to my second point and something that Dr. Hort said. How are we engaging and communicating environmental science to uh, non-environmental scientists? So fundamentally, I think every scientist uh, exists to improve human well-being. I, I think that's a pretty accurate broad statement. Uh, in my opinion, though, I think science has become, has become increasingly exogenous to the political process. And I think that we as scientists have become collectively worse at speaking to policymakers, speaking to stakeholders and to the general public. Uh, and the result has been an increasingly uninformed political system, an uninformed public. There's lack of diversity in funded research. There are increasingly siloed science and policymaking, and that's all to the detriment of the things that we try to, to achieve. And how do we begin to solve this and break down the barriers between scientists and non-scientists? I think we start by changing the way we conduct science by becoming endogenous to the political process. This means that when we conduct science, we must not only work to minimize uncertainties in the hypotheses that we're testing or the goals that we're trying to achieve, we must also jointly minimize the uncertainty in the political decision-making process by engaging policymakers and stakeholders from the start. We also have to become greater advocates for our science. And most importantly, as Dr. Hort said, advocates for transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary science. But my third point kind of gets to your, your exact question about COVID-19. Um, and this comes with how we balance science advocacy versus the advocacy of scientific belief. So I'm going to guess that the majority of people tuning in are strong supporters of the idea that global climate change is occurring and that we must act immediately and definitively to avoid certain temperature thresholds uh, that are predicted to cause catastrophic damage to human and natural systems, including the emergence of novel infectious diseases. So last year, when COVID was rapidly spreading, uh, as you mentioned, several scientists were making claims that COVID-19 was strongly tied to temperature increases. Some of these claims were based on data. Some of them were extensions of a theoretical link between disease and climate change. And the problem is that the communication of the science and the advocacy became obfuscated, very confusing from a general consumer point of view. But even the science that was being conduct conducted and published in peer reviewed journals were a little bit suspect. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So there was one analysis that used daily data from 122 Chinese cities for 38 days between January and February, and they established a linear significant relationship between temperature and COVID-19, concluding that there was no evidence 
that COVID-19 would decline with warmer temperatures. There was another analysis, another publication, roughly the same time frame, it's 40 days, that had daily data from 31 provinces in China, and they concluded that the epidemic intensity declined after high temperatures. And then there was a study in Brazil that was also published between February 27th and April 1st, just 35 days of data. And they found that temperature had a negative relationship with case counts with a flattening of case counts around 25.8 degrees Celsius. And they said in their final statement that it supported governance for healthcare uh, policy making. So I'm not going to sit and debate whether or not these relationships between temperature and COVID-19 are real or not, but I raise the question of whether anyone, anyone on this call can truly believe that 30 days of data are sufficient to convince you that a climate health relationship exists. I mean, I can guarantee you that if I were to analyze 30 days of case data on malaria, which is my area, or dengue, shigella, tuberculosis, Ebola, to demonstrate that temperature had a significant relationship over a 30 day period, and then broadly infer how that, what that means across a large spatial or temporal scale, I can guarantee you it would be rejected from every journal. So the question is, why did some of these articles get published? Why were we trying to state whether or not a climate health relationship exists when there really was no statistical power to believe that that relationship was true, let alone have any ability to replace, to, to place any reasonable confidence in roles around the relationship. I question whether or not this was an attempt for the advocacy of climate science. And I think that's an important question. What I do know is that the articles that I have found on the environment health links with COVID all come from environmental journals. In the examples that I gave you, if you look at the co-authors or the authors of the study, they come from a business school, school of management, computational modeling, physics, which is great that you have an interdisciplinary perspective. There was only one article that I found that was published with anyone with a public health background. Now, I'm not saying that a physicist or computational modeler can't understand or communicate epidemiological findings. It doesn't mean that their analysis is wrong. What I'm saying is that if you have an interdisciplinary problem, you should have an interdisciplinary team addressing it. Now, whether or not you believe or disagree with me and you believe that the study conclusions are, are valid, I think it's undeniable. I think everyone on the call would believe that the communication with policymakers was quite poor. In my own country, which is probably the worst example of a politician communicating poorly, but in my own country, we had politicians stating that in the Northern Hemisphere, COVID-19 was going to disappear in the summertime because of warm weather. They were ignoring a lot of confounding factors like human behavior, the host immune system, the environment itself, all of which influence the, the different uh, transmission risks between the winter and the summer. So I think that this combined problem of publishing poorly designed studies and then having politicians communicating findings in sometimes contrasting ways, uh, followed by the major resurgence of COVID during the summertime has led to a lot of skepticism in public health and climate science. And it's really threatened our ability to communicate things in a independent uh, scientific perspective. I have another personal example that I can share with you if someone's curious about mercury and gold mining. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the details, but I will just tell you that uh, there, in, in my work in Peru, USAID about 10 years ago had issued a report stating that 80% of people were exposed to a, a, uh, a threshold of mercury that was considered unhealthy. And my point to them was that the studies that they were, the, the one study that they had used was actually had a design flaw in it, but they still wanted to use their report to generate political support around gold mining and mercury. That was a tactical um, strategy that they wanted to use because they needed to take advantage of it now, but it demonstrated the difference between 
how I would want to use science and communicate it in one way, and politicians need to use it and communicate it in another way to generate support, uh, generally speaking. But you know, there, there can be consequences to this. As I said before, there's, uh, there's mistrust in science now that is, is kind of growing in a way that's most likely unhealthy and uh, threatening for, for most people that are on the call. But there are still situations uh, that we have to communicate information without having actual data to support those recommendations. I would say in COVID-19, we didn't have a need to immediately communicate a relationship between climate and health. The most critical thing with COVID was to reduce human life lost. So in other words, we probably needed more information about how non-pharmaceutical in interventions were actually slowing transmission. There were theoretical SIR models, which if you know what an SIR model is, and those were helpful. There, is, there, there was data from the, uh, the, the pandemic flu in the early 1900s that we could lean on, uh, but there were no real empirical studies that were generated, except I think there was one in Hong Kong and one in Taiwan that provided a little bit of data to say that non-pharmaceutical in interventions could work if they were implemented and followed um, in a certain way. But when we, when we do think about communicating information with very limited data and very limited way of, of quantifying uncertainty, what I would say is, first of all, to do that, you need to have an interdisciplinary team. And I am a biostatistician, so I would recommend that you have at least one statistician on that interdisciplinary team. And I say that basically because uh, when we have limited data, you need to have the content experts present to provide a transdisciplinary perspective on finding a solution. But you need, in my opinion, uh, a statistician to help each content expert think about the types of uncertainty that might exist in the recommendations that they're giving. It can be helpful. The second thing I would recommend is just being transparent with the assumptions and limitations. That's a very simple one. Um, I, I, that's not too difficult in situations where you don't have a lot of data, uh, but the assumptions and limitations are very important. And I think it actually goes and has a, a direct correlation with how we do something called a theory of change. But the last recommendation I would recommend, uh, when, especially when we have uh, you know, information being given to policymakers with limited data, is to have an experienced science communicator or a team of communicators be your public face, be your public contact. Uh, there are examples in COVID where we have seen um, very good scientists uh, do a very poor job of explaining science and a very poor job of saying things to the public. It's not to say that they're bad scientists. It's just to say that there are communicators that this is their, th this is what they, they do. They are science communicators and they are experts in what they do. And we should make sure that we have an expert science communicator to um, explain things to a diverse public. Um, so I hope these comments are useful. Uh, they're based on my own experiences and struggles with science communication and science policy relationships. And I'm, I'm happy to, to answer any questions and um, reflect on any other thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, your presentation actually provoked already some questions and our are in the, in the question and answer box. And I would encourage all the participants actually to go and put their questions in the question and answer box and start voting for those questions. So you can, you can put the thumb up if you like the questions so that we will take those questions first. Our, but before we move to the question, we have one more panelist who will bring to the story what um, uh, uh, William told us are uh, even more complicated because, uh, yeah, we may have an uncertainty. We may be the poor communicators. We want to run fast. But what happens is that in those situations, which are super critical, we get another phenomenon, which is the spread of misinformation. And that information, which is not uh, spread by are people who are not sure or 
they don't know are they intentionally spread the misinformation, which actually confuses the policy making and probably are, as Dr. Pian rightly said, described signs are uh, making a damage to us as a scientific community. We have Nadezhda with us, who is an expert in this information. And I would like Nadezhda to actually tell us a little bit more about how we as a scientific community can distinguish between the real information and misinformation. And what are the implications of this misinformation or wrong information um, and the decision making? And how we as a scientific community can protect ourselves when it is already very difficult to communicate science and be very transparent with policy making when you have those cases of misinterpretation and the incorrect information and misinformation which is spread in particular through social media. Nadezhda, please. Thank you very much for your kind invitation and uh, good morning to everybody and nice greetings from Austria. I am speaking here also on behalf of my co-authors who come mainly from the University of Stockholm and uh, also from Hellenistic University in Greece. And um, the results of this presentation will reflect the results generated in frame of the Horizon 2020 uh, project supported by the European Commission, which is called CoinForm. I would like to uh, start with the background on the misinformation and why it's so damaging now in communication today. And uh, please, the next slide. Uh, yes, misinformation is not a new uh, phenomena. It's existed already for a long time. We have already evidence from the ancient Greece, for example, when misinformation was placed in societies. And here I would like to say also that there is a misinformation and there is a disinformation. So the difference is in intention, how intentionally uh, with such kind of information, disinforming news being spread. But nowadays it's becoming especially influential because of technologies. Technologies make the spread of misinformation almost universal. Anybody in any part of the world uh, who has access to internet and uh, who is sufficiently popular to spread it through social networks could spread any kind of, of news. Uh, what is also especially damaging, if you go, for example, to behavioral economics and uh, to the work of Kahneman uh, about our systems of reasoning, uh, how we perceive the risk, how we perceive information, there are these two systems, uh, think fast, think slow, and one is much more logical at the same time as another one is emotional, and uh, misinformation is targeting exactly the second one. So it's being placed much faster, people perceive it much faster, it addresses some kind of emotional triggers and being settled there, it's much more difficult to correct because usually the correction tools, they are addressing our logical uh, reasoning, our logical uh, system. Misinformation creates all kinds of misperceptions which might lead uh, to prejudice, to misconditions, they might influence behavior also in crisis situation and in times of mitigation of crisis. So it might become really quite damaging. And uh, one of the points of misinformation is also that it creates information bubbles, especially in the internet and social media, which do not really allow for discourse what traditional media usually do. So at once misinformation uh, created opinion, a precondition of someone then this person automatically would be searching for further information, which is supporting these misconditions. And uh, this is also especially important for the times of crisis and for understanding, for perceiving the risk, because frequently here we speak here about subjective perceptions of the risk, so-called cognitive and uh, behavioral biases, which influence these subjectives. And misinformation is sitting exactly there. So this is uh, what makes people react differently than what would be actually expected. Uh, so misinformation could lead to erosion of public trust, also in institutions, in the media. It could dangerously disrupt the political debate uh, for a certain time. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, addressing misinformation in social media is getting uh, difficult for several issues. 
uh, first one, because currently a lot of tools uh, are being developed by technical companies and uh, we measured the level of trust to different tools and frequently citizens don't trust uh, profit-driven technical companies. The legis legislation often also backfires with accusations of censorship and of course internet is a free space, there are democratic freedoms, so we cannot sense the internet and uh, that is why any kind of uh, correction of misinforming news might be also problematic. Fact-checkers, uh, which is a growing and popularity profession now, are getting overwhelmed by the, the volumes of information which have to be checked. And uh, this was especially evident during the last pandemic crisis when uh, the volumes of in information became enormous and the quality of this information was not always due to expectations. And all this also makes difficulties uh, to create, difficulties to address the issue of misinformation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in uh, our project, uh, when we started uh, with the issue of misinformation, the idea was to develop two tools and uh, these tools would target different uh, stakeholders. So we planned to develop browser plugin, which would provide users with misinformation ratings of social media posts. So it would rate the post. It could also provide corrected information, uh, which would be collected through several fact checkers. And uh, this would be the tool which uh, aims mainly for professional users, such as journalists and fact checkers themselves, but also citizens who would like to be informed about misinformation. And then the dashboard for fact checking journalists and policymakers to detect, track, and predict the spread of evaluation of misinformation on the web. And uh, the beauty of this approach was that it was a co-creation of the tools together with stakeholders. So all three groups of stakeholders participated from the beginning. They provided their input, they helped us to shape the tools and they helped us to develop the tools according to their expectations on usability and usefulness of the tools. Uh, next one, please. Uh, one example is the tool Miss Info Me, uh, which was developed in frames of this project. And uh, this tool determines credibility scores for quit accounts. So it goes through various quit accounts and it shows the scores through the websites and through Facebook pages. Uh, for example, for Twitter account, Miss Info Me scores are based on the following. It provides assessment which is done uh, about the profile coming from published reports. So this is a tool which does not provide judgment by itself, but uh, it works like a big data tool, which is based on the judgments already done by fact checkers reviewing a tweet account from the selected profile. Or for example, if a profile appeared on the public listings, which placed this profile already into relation to misinformation accounts, then you could also see it in the tool and it would reduce the score for such news item. It also looks to internet links being used and uh, uh, how the fact checkers evaluated this tool. And it provides the sources which were used for this assessment. So it creates complete transfer transparency about what kind of sources were used for such ratings and evaluations. Uh, next one, please. Uh, uh, currently, uh, we are checking our tools with different groups of stakeholders. Uh, so we conduct decision-making experiments, what is actually important for them in these tools. And uh, we identified that uh, various groups of stakeholders, of course, have various expectations on the usabilities of these tools. Uh, the decision-making experiments based on games, on multi-criteria decision analysis, on rankings, uh, were conducted in three countries, in uh, Greece, uh, Austria, and Sweden. And, um, uh, then evaluated with decide IT mathematical tool, uh, which allows to put mathematical weights on different uh, evaluations and on different alternatives. And uh, what was quite surprising for us, it's a dominance of so-called passive uh, attitude across all these observed countries towards the tools on misinformation. So people would like to be informed. They would like to know who put misinforming news, why, when, how it was spread. But everything what is uh, connected with more active position uh, was actually ranked quite low in terms of preferences. Uh, so here we could see that such kind of tools could be mainly used for stimulating critical thinking, for providing more transparency, 
but uh, they cannot, uh, people would not really use them uh, for being actively active themselves in the space, in the web space, while providing more corrective information. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, and uh, uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, I would welcome your comments, uh, your suggestions. And uh, I also would like to highlight here that our aim was to create the tool which stimulates critical thinking. So which would break this instant uh, interaction between our perceptions or our emotional perception, which forms to subjective risk, which might be formed based on the misinforming news and uh, create maybe through this tool, just like uh, highlighting to stakeholder, to citizen who is using it. Hey, please think twice. Maybe there is something wrong with news, this news. Please look for another time, for another source. So this was the main aim of our tool. And this is how I think uh, there would be possible to maybe not really to fight misinformation online, but to provide citizens with the tool being uh, better informed about contested issues. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nadezhda. And our, I would immediately comment, if the citizens wanted to check the information, that's another question if they're really interested. And our, it's, as, as you mentioned, this uh, think fast, think slow. We are always trapped in the confirmation bias and we're just buying whatever falls comfortable to us. So I will just jump directly into the questions because we already have 10 questions and I wanted to go through these questions before we get to the conclusion of the session because questions are very interesting. I will just read the questions and then you can reflect on those uh, whoever from the panel wants or to answer the question and then we take the next one. So the first question goes to all panelists. And uh, it seems that we as scientists are currently not communicating with policymakers in an optimal way. This causes the policymakers and politicians to make decisions that are not in line with scientific findings and lead to frustration within the scientific community. How do you think we could improve the link between science and policymaking? Should we think about adding very short policy relevant summaries to scientific articles if applicable? Are there other short-term solutions that we could consider and implement? Or who want to reflect first? I can see William is uh, smiling, so probably you can start. And I would invite other panelists to provide a short comments on this question as well. Uh, thanks for that question. I, I, I really like that question. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. I attended a workshop at um, the, the World Academy of Sciences in Trieste a couple of years ago. It was a train the trainers workshop on science diplomacy. If you know what science diplomacy is, it essentially is, is improving communication between scientists and policymakers. The workshop involved both scientists who were chemists, atmospheric scientists, health workers, as well as diplomats and policymakers from all over the world. And First thing that I learned uh, when people were talking about uh, how to improve science communication was the fact that several people who were policymakers told me that when they meet with scientists, they have a lot of anxiety in talking to scientists. And I thought that was interesting because when I talk to policymakers, I always am trying to think about how do I have a message that's very clear to them. And so I get anxious about speaking to the science, the policymaker. And so the realization that policymakers have probably an equal amount of anxiety, maybe even more than uh, what a scientist would have when the scientist and the policymaker get together to discuss something was a realization that um, we need to do a better job of just simple engagement. Um, I don't think any policymakers, actually I know no policymaker reads peer review journals, unless they actually came from a scientific discipline and then became a policymaker later. Um, but, you know, there, there are a lot of a lot of ways that we can improve uh, science communication and improvement with um, talking to policymakers. I think this idea of science diplomacy and training in science diplomacy is is one important step. Um, and, and that 
is fundamental to making sure that uh, science is communicated properly and making sure that policymakers are understanding what we are, are trying to do. The other thing I would just say, which I mentioned in my, my comments, is that uh, if you can engage policymakers from the start so that some of your research questions are actually motivated by, by, policy, uh, by policy questions, I think that's a great way of getting policymakers involved. That's what we do for a lot of our mercury and gold mining research. Uh, just to give you an example, we are talking with uh, the US Department of State, the, uh, the Ministry of Environment in Peru and the Ministry of Environment in Colombia. And we have workshops dedicated specifically to generating uh, questions that policymakers have and whether or not those are things that are already informed by science or whether those are things that we need to generate information on. And I think that that engagement is uh, very helpful for the policymaker. As an academic, I can tell you it's not, a, it's not a rewarding exercise in terms of writing publications and generating um, peer-reviewed data, um, but it does have a purpose for making sure that science is communicated properly. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Our other panelists want to comment on this. Or I think Vasiti, you are probably scientist who is a policymaker at the same time. <laughs> what do you think about that? Is it do you find it difficult to communicate science in Fiji? Uh, thank you. Uh, I guess it's a case by case basis. Huh? Uh, for us in Fiji, being a developing country uh, and being part of government, uh, the lack of uh, research and science that's championed by government in itself. Uh, and so therefore coming in wearing my scientist hat into the role and you know advising government about scientific proof methodology that we need to adopt, it's giving them a whole different perspective about uh, you know decision making. I mean impact-based forecasting has been used around the world for years. Uh, when I went into the role, I introduced the, you know, the 50 kilometer buffer zone just to ensure that uh, we narrow down our, our, our response effort to be, more, to be more focused and to be more targeted. Um, so the, uh, you know, the, the information, the projects, you know, there's a lot of research has been done across the Pacific. Uh, it now comes down to government uh, taking ownership of those projects uh, and championing it. Uh, uh, and this is something that we're currently doing at the NDMO is not only uh, you know, attending to response, but also we are now working on actually writing papers uh, to further enhance the knowledge and the skills that we have here within our own government. Huh? Uh, one of which, which I'd mentioned earlier, we're currently developing impact-based forecasting uh, paper using uh, traditional knowledge versus science. Uh, with, there's a lot of uh, traditional knowledge here in Fiji about forecasting a major tropical cyclone when it's about to make, uh, uh, you know, when it's developing. Uh, TCS uh, before it happened or even before uh, it uh, hit Fiji, there were already signs uh, that was, uh, you know, the elders within Fiji were already sharing that there's going to be a major cyclone that's going to make an impact. And you know, a couple of weeks later, that did make an impact. So these critical information is something that we want to document. Um, further to that, uh, you know, government uh, is now looking for Fiji. Uh, we, we we are focusing on you know scientific proven methodology, um, and this is something that uh, the NDMO is now working towards uh, very closely with the Met Office, uh, you know, with our seismology unit to ensure that. When we advise our leaders, it is based out of science. Uh, and this is uh, a new approach that we're trying to do to ensure that we bring the science into policy. Uh, and in doing that, we're able to change our policy uh, to uh, forecast the impacts of any disaster. And also it's assisting us with our response effort. Uh, thank you, Vasiti. This is this is actually very interesting because we we see quite a quite an interesting difference in the messaging between uh, between William and Vasiti. It seems that there is a slightly higher trust in science in developing countries than in developed countries. Uh, Matt, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say. I mean, I agree with what both of the previous panel members have said, and I think. 
a big part of this is about what I call peacetime communications. It's about building that relationship, um, which actually can be harder for less frequent events because you know they don't have the motivation for those conversations. And as scientists, we also it's not about talking to policymakers. I get quite worried when people talk about talking to. It should be about a conversation. It's a two-way process. We need to listen to them and then adjust how, what we're doing in line with, with that. Um, because some of it's, it's not always about communicating badly and we need to improve our communication. At the end of the day, decision-making process isn't just about the science. We often get hung up that the science says they should do this and they didn't do that. But there can be other reasons why they didn't do it, not just misunderstanding. There can be economic things. There can be social, societal reasons for not doing it. There can be other consequences you know, evacuating a town, you will kill somebody through the process of evacuation. You will injure people through the process of evacuation. So you need to balance that against the danger posed by what the hazard is. And it's not always just a cut and dry question. So we, we do need to sort of separate, I think, between the aspects that arise due to poor communications and lack of understanding and their poor, poor decisions. And, and decisions that arise due to a balancing between good information that just happens to come down on the side that as scientists we think is perhaps the wrong side. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, just, just along the lines which you said, uh, mentioning economic uh, issues, uh, I will just read a comment uh, which is not on the top of our list, but it's number three, which actually echoes to what you say. Uh, and the, the question is put by an anonymous attendee saying that in Germany we have a completely different problem. Inter interdisciplinary scientists had direct contact to high rank politicians, explaining them are the secured fact and limitations, making forecast for different scenarios. They were ignored because of economic reasons and the forecasts raising number of infection came true. The political pattern was and is listen, ignore, fail, repeat. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it echoes quite well. So there are multiple other factors that can actually play a significant role. So I will I will take one more question, which is on the top of the list, and which says it's a, it is addressed to all the panelists. Uh, and I think that that's the the last question we will probably able to answer. Are uh, would you say that being an activist as a scientist? in order to reach out to policymakers, makes you more or less credible. When I align my research with my behavior, I feel that I must do more than publish in order to communicate with policymakers and the general public. Or who wanna take this one? Nadezhda? Uh, I, th I think I would also uh, shortly address also to the previous one, to the yeah. science too, because this is a very interesting question for us. And uh, actually at IASA, we are dealing with the question of science to policy divide already for quite some years, as we are not purely a research organization, but uh, how our management, our director used to say, we are an organization which stands on two legs. One leg is research and science, and another leg is uh, policy. So we have to harmonize with science to policy divide also for our research. And uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I, I, I would like to say that um, communicating with policymakers, we have a um, uh, communication department which helps us with policy briefs. And uh, it shows to be sometimes very intensive interaction because we as scientists used to use special words and uh, these people are helping us how such message could be shaped in a way that it would be perceived um, accordingly so that it would be usable for policymakers. Uh, we also have uh, some uh, science dip diplomacy officers uh, who help with uh, dissemination of knowledge. Um, I also would like to mention here different votes that of course scientists, so they exist in the vote of peer reviewed papers, but uh, as it was said also before policymaker would uh, seldomly uh, read it, peer reviewed uh, paper and besides of these uh, databases are frequently also don't, even though we try to publish open access, it's not always available to everybody, but uh, one of the efficient ways is to speak at policy forums 
And uh, there is a number of organizations which does a fantastic uh, work in this respect. Like for example, OECD has several rounds where they bring scientists, they bring experts to talk to policymakers to provide their input uh, to stimulate discussions. Also OSTB, also other organizations. So there are these policy events. But uh, I also think that in scientific career, also providing policy impact uh, should be uh, should create also some value because currently we are evaluated by peer review papers, by impact, by citations, but policy impact is not yet uh, so so much in common. And uh, while addressing the issue of activism and advocacy, uh, I, I think of course it's important to work also with various stakeholders and um, involve their uh, perceptions and opinions in the research. But uh, for us as a scientist, so I, I think it's important to, to stay also neutral, especially in the social science. Of course, we all have positions and we look through certain lenses uh, on societal events, but still trying to keep maybe this more neutral position uh, despite a, a, any fact which we see and be um, honest and transparent about assumptions. I, I think this this might be a way to go. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else wanted to reflect on how does it compare being activist and being scientist? Does it discredit our science if we become activist? Any fast reflections on that before we go to voting? Yes, sir. I'll just have a quick comment on that. Uh, I guess for us here, uh, from experiences, uh, as alluded in the discussion, you know, the difficulty of having to interpret uh, science language, if I may say. Uh, so previously practice, uh, a lot of our researches have been done in a, you know, done in a very technical way that as uh, respondents to disaster management, which uh, we should really think in, in general context because we are responding and for us life saving is paramount. Uh, having a very technical paper really does not help you know, a disaster manager who does not have a scientific head. Um, so this is something that has been practiced over the years, as if, if I must say, having a very scientific paper done uh, and left to, uh, to, an, to NDMO, in our case, left to our office. Uh, and you know, for us, uh, those that have been here before me, not understanding basically what is in the paper because our main mandate is to save lives. Uh, so again, re-alluding to what the, the, you know, the, the forum has been discussing, the importance of leveraging the, the terminology used to ensure that you know, non-science background can also take the important message out of that uh, information. And that is critical uh, for, for, for disaster, manage, disaster management such as us. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we would like to do the Mentimeter, but before we go to Mentimeter, can I, can I just ask uh, all the panelists are uh, just in one sentence to, to communicate a key message which you want our community to take from this debate? We will start from Matt, please. What is the key message? The key message. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> I think it. I think it is um, that we shouldn't shy away from the uncertainty, even when we can't quantify it. We should acknowledge its existence um, in our communications and in the way we talk about the work. Um, it may not always be possible to integrate it properly or to use it properly. And there are challenges with user acceptance of uncertainties, but to not include discussion of it is to undermine our science in the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, William? I think that was a great message that, uh, that <laughs> Matthew just said. I would, uh, I would probably have my, my main message, just to add on to that one, is, uh, is the, the use of science diplomacy for Im improving science um, communication. Thanks. Nadia. 
Uh, yes, my key message is that um, sometimes such issues as misinformation tend to be ignored, but uh, I would like to highlight again the importance of this um, uh, issue and uh, that we need tools to address it because without them, uh, the efforts on communication, they could uh, disappear from the effects of misinformation and technologies are now making it possible. But at the same time, we should also consider uh, our, uh, other ongoing processes. Like for example, we should not limit democratic rules or censor internet. So yeah, this is a little bit a contested policy issue, but I'm, I, I'm certain that solution could be, could be found. And also to back up on the previous message, the science diplomacy uh, uh, is, is important in communication. Vasiti, what is your key message? We already heard your message. We are to save lives. So <laughs> give us best sides to save lives. My, my, I guess, uh, you know, I can't beat what the others have just mentioned. Uh, however, I would probably just say, uh, you know, we need to use science to strengthen community engagement, making that a priority in, in all phases of disaster response. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, panelists. And now we will see if this is a key message which our community took from this uh, discussion. Voila. So. Well, from, from the screen, you can see that uh, you guys on the panel are probably exceptional cases because the, the majority of scientists, we can see that it's uh, 29 versus 13. So it's uh, three quarters who actually are, have never been in a situation when they have to provide a decision making relevant scientific information. So I think that they understood from this discussion how difficult it is. Claudia, can we move from me to the next one? So how comfortable are you to communicate information that did not get through peer review? So which is are the information that is preprints or I don't know, some stuff on the internet. Oh, that is interesting. So we have some some clients for Nadezhda who are very comfortable to <laughs> communicate to whoever they find in internet. <laughs> So this this is this is quite interesting. So people are quite comfortable are to communicate information which hasn't gone through peer review, which is quite an interesting conclusion. Though it can be just the law of small numbers where we have non-representative statistics, but it seems that it's uh, between rather uncomfortable and rather comfortable, and it's not really super extreme reactions. Can we move on to the next one? So do you think it is the obligation of the scientific community to provide information for critical decision making? Okay, I think that this is really great feedback that most of the community think that it is our role to an obligation to provide the scientific information for critical decision making. So this is this is really very great outcome. 
at least we just need to learn how to do it properly. Probably. Let's move on. Next question, please. So the next question is, uh, does your organization have a position on decision support by the employees? Like, do, do you know if there is any regulation like your director or your executive tells you that you cannot talk to, you cannot talk to the, our general public or to anyone and you have a regulation which prevents you from communicating or you have a policy where you are quite open and you can go and communicate the science to the our critical decision making. This this is this is actually a good thing, uh, a good uh, thing for thought. <clears throat> because we can see that most of people actually don't know <clears throat> if such policy exists in the organization or not. So, and probably if you don't know, you, you are very uncomfortable communicating whatever you want to say. Excellent. So let's move on to next question. And I think this is our last, no. The one before the last one. Yes. Uh, do you assist in distilling the facts from misinformation? You personally, as a scientist, do you advise anybody? Do you go to social media and write in the blogs that this is nonsense? <laughs> I think we can move on to the next question. We can see, yes, that uh, quite a substantial percentage of the scientists actually do such function on the social media. And our last question is, what is a key message from this debate? What did you bring into your knowledge, into your life, into your understanding from this great debate? Okay, so I think that from this picture, we can see that Matt communicated the message very clearly. Don't shy away from uncertainty. If there is uncertainty, communicate it, say it. Say what we know and what we don't know. I think that was excellent. And um, with, with this conclusion, I would like to thank all our panelists are you were brilliant are your interventions were absolutely marvelous and super interesting i think uh, that our people who wanted to repeat or follow up the debates they will be recorded and they will be available from edu so that they can follow up on the debates and they can they can actually listen to it once again my special super special thank goes to bill was probably already asleep <laughs> with the 4 a.m. in the morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Our, uh, thank you, Vasiti, for joining us from Fiji. Thank you, Nadezhda and Matt, for, for joining this, this beautiful discussion. And uh, thanks to the audience who followed this conversation. Thank you very much and have a great day.